evening. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. It's good to see each and every one of you. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for you being on the throne of this universe. And Heavenly Father, we look at all the various things that are going on in our world, especially over in the Middle East, in the name of their God that are coming against Israel and ultimately uh, coming against you because you are the God of Israel. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you have grafted in the Gentiles, meaning us. God, you set Israel aside, and they're under a judicial temporary blindness. And God, as we look into the tribulation period, we see where, God, that's going to be lifted. We're going to see 144,000 sealed and witnessing. We're going to see two-thirds of them killed. And we're going to see the remaining recognizing you as their Messiah when you come back. Heavenly Father, in the meantime, though, we have all of these wars that are taking place. And Lord, we, we understand that war over there is nothing new. And Lord, it's going to continue to be like that until you do come back. But in reality, it continue to be like that until the Antichrist makes peace. He establishes a covenant with Israel for three and a half years, and he'll break that. Literally, supposedly, making it for seven years, but breaking it midway through. So, Heavenly Father, that there will literally be a false peace. But God, when you come back and you reign from the throne of David, Lord, that will be authentic. And in the meantime, God, we're told to pray for Israel, to pray for Jerusalem. And so, God, we do intercede for them tonight, Lord. We pray that you would continue to have your hand upon them. And, and Lord, we know right now, God, that there are many things that have become as a fallout. There are Americans over there as well. And so, Heavenly Father, we just pray, God, this would come to an end soon. Lord, we pray for the families, Lord, that are affected by this, uh, that are here in the United States, and also, obviously, over there as well. And Lord, we also pray for, uh, even though we're far removed, we tune in by news and network to keep up on that, but nevertheless, God, there is another battle going on, and not so much, Lord, in the physical realm, but obviously in the spiritual realm. And Lord, tonight we pray for our WANA group and our, our youth group and for us here tonight. Lord, that spiritual battle, it's unseen, but it's certainly physically felt uh, in our world when we see in our world a departure from you. So tonight, God, we just pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray for each boy and girl in our WANA and in our youth ministry. We pray for each man and woman here tonight uh, in our Bible study as we attempt to look into the end times that we are quickly, quickly headed to tonight. And God, we thank you again for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we do pray. Amen. Well, guys, Francis isn't going to be here. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, bypass that. And, and let me just tell you, uh, if you've got a prayer need, go ahead and um, write that down. We'll take that up toward the end. And while it's on my mind, I got a text from Morgan uh, there is a sign-up sheet out there in the foyer for Christmas poinsettias. Uh, you know, we get those from PG. She works there in the, the greenhouse and the ag uh, area there. And uh, every year we get those through her. Uh, they, her students grow them, and they tend to them and, and nurture them, and so we buy from them. And so there is a sign-up sheet out there. I don't know the date deadline. I'm sure it's on that sheet. And uh, if you would like a Christmas poinsettia to be placed here in the sanctuary, and, and we'll do the in honor of and memory of as well. Uh, but if you'd like one, please sign up out there as soon as you can. That way she can begin even now making plans for that. 
Uh, feed shelter tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. The ball game, as you look here, and it's really two things, feeding PG football team. Tammy didn't change that. Uh, the date is this Friday. They're, they're actually expecting a lot of rain and stuff coming in Friday, so they moved Friday night's game to tomorrow night. Uh, so that would have originally, senior night is tomorrow night, Thursday night. They're going to do away with the JV game, try to reschedule that. However, we are uh, not tomorrow night. We are the following Friday night. So we are the 27th, okay? So we are the last uh, game of this month. And I think it's actually the last game of the season uh, if they don't go to the playoffs, okay? So with tomorrow night being senior night, then I know they've only got one more game. That would be a away game. So that is the one that we're doing. That would be on the 27th. And then this Saturday... Uh, Pre-concert or pre-event stuff starts at 4.30. Ignite Randolph starts and kicks off at 5 p.m. That's over in the Bicentennial Park. Bring you a lounge chair, whatever else. Uh, hopefully the rain that they're forecasting to come in Friday will be gone. And uh, I think, though, I'm not sure, uh, it may be a little cooler, uh, but I can't remember. All right, and then the following Saturday is our fall festival, okay? Don't forget also this Saturday... From, I think uh, the announcement's over there somewhere. Uh, 11 to 1 p.m., I think it is, is uh, Dallas and Natalie's wedding shower. That'll be across the street, okay? Uh, they finished the gym today, and we're to stay off of it until Friday, okay? So uh, as far as we know, they're going to plan to have the event over there that Saturday, okay? So uh, tomorrow, I was told we need to keep the door shut. Uh, today and tomorrow, I think, Friday morning, we can open them up and maybe put some fans in there or, or blowing in or blowing out, try to get some of the fumes, you know, lifted a little bit. I was in there today, uh, not on it, but just walked inside. It's not really terrible. Uh, however, you know, it's, it's a new varnish, and it's going to smell like that for probably a couple of weeks, okay? Uh, but they are finished with that, and... Um, Looking forward to getting back in there. I've had a lot of people texting me wanting to know when can teams get back in there to practice. And then you see the Lord's Supper that's coming up. Also, the end of this month is a special call business meeting to approve the 2023-2324 nominations, okay? And then you also see Thanksgiving dinner coming up, all right? Well, with that said, as far as I know, that's all the announcements that we have, um, Let's go ahead and take our Bibles, and let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. And in case I forget to mention her, uh, i tell you what, just so I won't forget, let me just write a name down. I went and seen her in the hospital yesterday. Uh, so let me just write this name down. So we'll make sure that we have uh, mentioned her during prayer time as well, okay? All right, so Matthew chapter 24. And you have your notes there in front of you tonight. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick back up in Matthew 24, where we were. But we're also going to leave from there and go back. And we didn't look at it a lot. We looked at it a little bit. But we're going to leave from here uh, when we began talking here just momentarily about the abomination of desolation. We're going to go back to Matthew, uh, not Matthew, but Daniel chapter 9. Okay, so if you want to find Daniel chapter 9, you can be there when I get there, all right? But right now, we are in Matthew chapter 24. You've got your notes here in front of you, and uh, looking at where we left off last week, I filled in a little bit. I don't think I filled in quite as far as we might have got last week, but nevertheless, you can fill those in tonight, okay? So uh, let's look here in Matthew chapter 24. And what we're doing is we're bouncing back and forth. As we read through and look at Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25, because both of these deal with the end times, we have been looking in Matthew chapter 24 how that relates to and where it relates to in the book of Revelation. All right, so I, be, I give you those notes there. And uh, so let's pick up in verse 1. And the Bible, and I'll tell you what, let's go back up. Just for the sake of those that may not have been here uh, last week or the week before, Look in chapter 23 and verse 37, 
And I want you to picture the Lord Jesus Christ descending on that donkey, the colt of an ass there, coming down the Mount of Olives. He pauses and he looks over the city of Jerusalem when his first entrance, during his first coming. And he knows what awaits him, but that's not what moves him to tears. What moves him to tears is the people's rejection and he knowing what awaits them. All right, so notice in verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens, under her wings, and you would not. And then in verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And then he says, and this would be what I believe a reference to when he comes back at the end of the tribulation, all right? I believe Revelation chapter 1, it may be verse 9 or 8 there, where they will look upon him, uh, the one they had pierced, and they're going to mourn, they're going to receive him as their Messiah. But notice in verse 39, For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, and I highlighted, I underlined that word till, till you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Right now, we are living in that word till. Okay, I mean, we're living in that time span from the time that he says this until the time that he comes back. All right. And that ties us back into Zechariah. We've looked at that. We're going to look at it briefly tonight as well. But then notice, and keep in mind, in verse 38 he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And then notice in verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple, how magnificent the temple and the building was. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, now keep in mind, in verse 38, he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He says, I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, if you go into Luke, and I think Luke speaks to it more, obviously we know that after this, the Roman general Titus in AD 70 came in and ravaged the city and burned down the temple. Uh, his original purpose or his original plan was to not do that to the temple, but his men did that. Uh, but nevertheless, Jesus, I think here, is looking past that to the end times. All right, notice what he says. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and this is what we call the Olivet Discourse. So when he comes out of the temple, he'll go down the Temple Mount, across the Kidron Valley, and up on the Beatitudes, up there on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? When shall our house be left unto us desolate? When shall not one stone be left upon another? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? In other words, you know, when are you going to establish the kingdom? And when is the end of the world? When is the end of the age you're going to come? And then beginning in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4, he begins to deal with these in reverse order. So notice in verse 4. And Jesus answered and he said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you be not troubled. And I do not believe that what is taking place now is a reference to this, okay, as far as you will hear of wars and, and rumors of war, uh, that's going to happen during the tribulation period as well, all right? Wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And that has been from the very beginning of history that that's taken place. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and in diverse places. And notice what he says. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. These are the beginning of birth pains. 1 Thessalonians 5, 
1 through 3. And Isaiah 13, verses 6 and following. All right? And so this is obviously then at the beginning of the tribulation period, the beginning of birth pains. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And notice this, and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. This is the second warning of that. The other was in verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And now in verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound. You think evil is evil and wickedness is wickedness permeated now? It's not yet. It's coming worse. The love of many shall wax, it shall become, it shall grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And we talked about that last week. We're not talking here about perseverance in salvation to be saved, albeit we do persevere in salvation because we are saved. Here, it's talking about in the tribulation period, your physical life. He that endures to the end, he that keeps the faith, all right, shall be saved. And this gospel shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then notice it says, and then shall the end come. Look in your outline here. If you look at the last blank I filled in, as far as the approaching end, there's going to be martyrs in verse 9. There's going to be worldwide chaos in verses 10 through 13. And the verses to the right of that is how it correlates to the book of Revelation. And then there's also going to be worldwide preaching. All right, This gospel will be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then it says, and then the end shall come. We liken this, fulfilled in Revelation, if you recall last week, the 144,000 that are sealed, the two witnesses that are slain in the street, uh, that God protected for three and a half, uh, you know, for three and a half years, and then also the angel in Revelation chapter fourteen, uh, going to and fro in the heavens and sounding, if you would, um, the gospel. Okay, well then notice tonight number three there. You've got the arrival of the end. The arrival of the end it says once these things take place, then the end will come. All right. And then we have here, beginning in verse 15, and this is where we believe a reference to somewhere around the midway of the tribulation, the abomination of desolation. That's what we're going to look tonight in the book of Daniel. All right, notice. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, this abomination of desolation, this image of the Antichrist, the image of the first beast is going to be placed in the temple, they're going to demand worship. We looked at that last week in Revelation where the false prophet is going to funnel worship to Antichrist in this uh, image. Let him that readeth, notice this, uh, when you see that, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. And then in beginning in verse 16, when you see that, flee. Those in Judea. Why in Judea? Because that is the closest there to this happening in Jerusalem. All right? Well, if you look there, okay, in Revelation, we won't go to it, but in Revelation chapter 13, it talks about that. But I want us tonight, okay, for a time being, I want you to go with me to the book of Daniel. And Daniel chapter 9, and let's see this prophecy worked out. Okay, Daniel chapter 9. So let me uh, move my little note sheet here. Let me just put it right here. And we're going to be here for a few minutes, all right? Matter of fact, we, I did not even, I know it's, I did not even bring my watch. Now, I know I've got 15 people in here who will give me the time. But um, nevertheless, all right, let me just put this. We get, I got a clock on the wall. All right, anyway, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, if you've been in Sunday school, 
you know that it is mainly known for the end, dealing with end times. But at the beginning, it's one of the great prayers of the Bible. Daniel, on behalf of his people, goes to God in prayer, and he repents on behalf of the nation of Israel. And so what I want us to do is, let's pick up, begin reading in verse 24, and we're going to come back to verse 1, all right? Notice in verse 24, Daniel is led to write, 70 weeks, literally in the Hebrew, 70 sevens, okay, 70 sevens, so 77 years, all right? So, look, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And now he's going to give us a list of things. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the, tr to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, the holy of holies. Now in this list, if you notice this list there, it's two sets of three. The first three deals with sin. The second three deals with righteousness. And we'll look at those momentarily. Notice in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks, shall Messiah, who is obviously the Lord Jesus Christ, shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall destroy the city, talking about Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined." And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That one week, and we'll say it again later, that one week is the seven-year tribulation. Okay? And that he there is the prince in the previous verse, which is the beast out of the sea in Revelation. That's the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to make this treaty, this covenant with Israel for a week meaning for seven years. And so, and we keep saying, well, you know what? He makes this covenant for Israel, with Israel in the tribulation period for three and a half years. He really, originally he makes it for seven years, the, the entirety of the tribulation. He just breaks it midway through. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, that's three and a half, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation, all right, the offering, to cease the sacrificial offering. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Notice that, the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. When you go to Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, puts it like this. When you see the abomination of desolation, so that's actually the abomination that makes, that, the abomination that makes desolate. What is that abomination that makes desolate? Well, years ago, obviously, centuries ago, Antiochus Epiphanes IV sacrificed a pig upon the altar. That was the abomination of desolation. What Antiochus was then, the Antichrist will be that and more in the tribulation period. And so during that time, Antiochus profaned the altar by spreading uh, sow's blood all over, you know, the altar there, defaming it, the Antichrist will not spread a pig or sow's blood or whatever it is on the altar. 
who was set up an image of himself in the temple to be worshipped. All right, that's the abomination that makes desolate in the end times. And so notice, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. All right? So let's go back to verse 24. And let's just kind of walk through this as it relates to Matthew and as it relates to Revelation. And we may not uh, finish here in Daniel tonight, all right? So in verses 24 through 26, and if you want to, you just kind of jot them down on your note sheet there on the back or something. But 70 weeks, all right? Notice there. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. 70 weeks from. From when? Well, notice in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from, from, the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. And so, if you look back into history, from the commandment or from the order, or it says commandment here, from the command of, and I think it was Artaxerxes, and we can look at that, in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1. So turn to Nehemiah for a second. You're in Daniel, just go a few books back to the left, all right? Go through Psalm, obviously, and you're going to find the book of Nehemiah. We went through Nehemiah not long after I came. All right, you're going to find Esther. You're going to go through Job. Look here in verse 1 of Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, or Nisan. And that's our April or May. That's around April or May. In the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up wine and gave it unto the king... Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. And wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? You know, Nehemiah was his cupbearer. And um, Nehemiah got word in chapter 1 that the walls of Jerusalem had been burned down and the gates were burned down. And Jerusalem was a reproach to all the enemies around. They could just come in and ravish what was left. And he says, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? Well, that would be fearful, because you were not allowed to be sad in front of the king, seeing that thou art not sick. And this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And the king said, Notice, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, graves, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, with the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. From that time, from this order of Artaxerxes to send Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So when you go back to Daniel chapter 9 and you look, know therefore from, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, that is that, Nehemiah, all right, chapter 2 and verse 1, okay? Now, when you look at this, these weeks are weeks of years, whereas weeks of days are described in a different way. I mean, if you look in Daniel chapter 10 for a second, look in Daniel chapter 10, look in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. And then notice what it says. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. So when he got this vision, he sat down and he mourned for three weeks. Is that three weeks of seven years? Well, obviously not. It's three weeks. Okay? Notice in the next verse. 
I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Okay, so he's talking about weeks. He's talking about weeks of days. Well, when you go back to Daniel chapter 9, he's talking about weeks of years. Okay, weeks of years. One week is seven years. And we're dealing with 70 years or 70 weeks. And so that's 70 times 7. But notice what it says here. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth in verse 25, from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, we looked at that, Artaxerxes, unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. Okay? Seven weeks. Sevens. Seven sevens. Okay? And three score and two weeks. Three score and two weeks. So you've got seven and then you got 62, and that makes 69. 69 sevens, 69 seven years, okay? So when you look at this, all right, this time that Daniel was speaking of spans from the Persian Artaxerxes, that is in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1, his decree to, to rebuild Jerusalem, and that was somewhere around 445 B.C., to the Messiah's kingdom. Okay? From that time unto the Messiah's kingdom. The time includes seven weeks of 49 years. All right, notice up here. Time to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Seven weeks, seven weeks of seven years, which is 49, all right, 49 years, okay? Possibly this takes us from Nehemiah chapter 2 through, and if you look at this, notice, let's read it again. To build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And so Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt, and the walls are going to be rebuilt. So this takes us from that commandment to rebuild those walls through and to the end of Malachi. All right, 49 years, if you look at this. All right. 62 weeks, read here if you would. Uh, just go back up. Know therefore, in verse 25, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, 49 years. And three score and two weeks, okay, that's 434 years. 434 more years. You got 49 and now you got 434 more years for a total of 483 years. 483 years. And so scholars tell us from the command from Artaxerxes to rebuild the temple, I mean to rebuild Jerusalem until the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ was 483 years, all right, 483 years. And so from that time to his coming, the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ was 483 years. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, remember we read that, in Matthew chapter 23, he's, he, he's coming down the Mount of Olives and he stops and he looks and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Okay, and he weeps over them. That moment right there. From his entry into Jerusalem to Nehemiah, 483 years. All right, filled to the dot. All right. Matter of fact, uh, it was on the ninth day of Nisan in A.D. 
A.D. 30 when he wrote in. But now notice what it says. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in turbulent times. He comes in, right? He, he rides in on, to Jerusalem, right? You're all with me, right? From, from Nehemiah to the time that he comes in, 483 years, according to Daniel right here. And prophecy bears it out. Well, then notice in verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, okay, shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Well, what is that a reference to? That's a reference to his death. He came and he died for our sin. Three and a half years later after he rode in. Okay. After he comes in, after that time, the Messiah will be cut off. We read about that in Zechariah. If you were to just go, and you can, if you want to just go to Zechariah for a second, and look in Zechariah chapter 13. Hold your finger there in Daniel. Look in Zechariah 13. The prophecy of Zechariah concerning end times. And primarily, uh, I tell you what, we'll read 7 through 9. We've read it multiple times from Ezekiel and also when we was in Daniel. But notice in verse 7, a prophecy. Zechariah says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. What shepherd is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the sword? That's the crucifixion. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. And I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. What happened when they crucified the Lord Jesus? He was abandoned. Everybody left him. That's what that's talking about. Now, if you were to continue to, to read... All right. And by matter of fact, Jesus quotes this verse in Matthew 26 and in verse 31. But notice in verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. That's what I said, you know, during my prayer to begin with. You know, two thirds of Israel, two thirds of the Jewish population are going to be killed in the tribulation period. He's going to bring one-third in verse 9. He's going to bring one-third through the fire, and they're going, to, they're going to make it through the tribulation period. They're going to be, remember there in Matthew chapter 24 where we read, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee. Those of you who are in Judea, flee. Those who live are the one-third. If you look here in verse 9. And I will bring one-third through the fire, through the tribulation period. And will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. And then notice this, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. This one-third is going to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what he said in Matthew chapter 23, in that last verse? Henceforth you shall see me no more until I come. And that's the end when he comes back. That's also Revelation chapter 1 in verses 8 or 9. I think it's 8, it could be 9. But go back, if you would, to Daniel. So, the Messiah is going to be cut off, but not for himself. I mean, he's, why is he crucified? Is he crucified for himself? No, he's crucified for us. All right? And so Daniel is telling us this. This time includes everything that we have just looked at. He's going to be cut off in the final seven years. Okay? Go back to verse 24 in Daniel. It says, 70 weeks are determined. 70 weeks. In verse 25 and 26, right now we've only got 69 weeks. We're missing one week of seven years. When is that? 
That's the tribulation period. That's the tribulation period. We are living in the time from where the Messiah was cut off until that 70th week. Okay? That 70th week is the seven-year tribulation period. Notice in verse 26, And after the threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, not for himself, he died for our sin and the people of the prince. Notice, they're going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Remember what Jesus said when he come down the Mount of Olives? He says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That's ultimately going to happen right before he comes back and Israel is surrounded by armies on every side at the Battle of Gog and Magog. And what's got my attention now? You know, I was reading the other day, I was watching Fox News. You know, uh, Egypt has shut their borders to us for humanitarian aid. And so we can't go that route. And so what the last reports I saw was Israel is surrounded and got enemies on each side. You know, what's going to happen here this time? The same thing. The same thing. And you know what? I can really tell you. I mean, I can see. You know, if you look at, at all the news uh, crews reporting now, and I'll tell you one of the things I wish they would do without is you can see them literally, the Hamas taking American women hostage, you know, grabbing them by their hair and throwing them in bands and stuff. You know, I'm going to tell you, as, as, as brutal as that is, we've not seen brutal yet. And the Roman people from whom the Antichrist will come will destroy the city of Jerusalem and its temple. He did that in A.D. 70 under Titus, okay? But he's going to do it again under the Antichrist. And so Daniel is going to look past that as well. All right. So this prophecy, you say, well, why this prophecy here? Go back and look in verse 24. And we've got just a couple of minutes, enough to read and close and go into prayer. Notice, 70 weeks. Remember, we're missing a week. That's going to be the tribulation period. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Two things. The first three deals with sin. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. That was through the blood of Jesus. The second one deals with righteousness, the set of three. To bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy. There's no more revelation. And to anoint the most holy, the holy of holies. Why does he throw this in here? Why, why the shift beginning at verse 24 to the end of the chapter? Why is this, verse 24 through 27, dealing with what it deals with? It's dealing with what it deals with because what it's dealing with is an answer to the prayer of Daniel that he prays in Daniel 9. And so let's go back and let's look at this prayer. And then we're going to go into our prayer time. Notice in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So they're in Babylonian captivity. You know what, 70 years, right? Okay. Uh, Daniel was somewhere, what, like 13 years old when he went into Babylonian captivity. And, and by the time he got thrown into the Daniel's, uh, Daniel's uh, well, the lion's den, he was around 90. Well, notice there in verse 3. Daniel says, it became known to me the prophecy of Jeremiah, 70 years in captivity. Why? Because of Israel's rebelliousness. Well, notice in verse 3. He said, upon that, I set my face, because he's nearing the end of that. 
I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful, terrible, awesome God, keeping the covenant and the mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments. Notice what he says of, he, of Israel. He's conf- like Nehemiah confessed the sins of Israel. So is, and he identified himself. He says, God, we have sinned. That's what Daniel's saying. He says, we have sinned. And have committed iniquity. And have done wickedly. And have rebelled. Even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. God, we have abandoned you. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Remember what Jesus said when he came down? Thou that hast killest and stonest the prophets. That's what they did. They killed them. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day. To the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel that are near, and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them. Listen, you've scattered Israel because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, shame of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel has transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore cursed, therefore curse is poured upon us, And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. I mean, it's prophesied. You listen, you turn away from me, and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be punished. You're going to be judged. And he have confirmed his words, which he spake against us, and against our judges. Talk about the judges, you know, the book of Judges. That judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven have not been done as have been done unto Jerusalem, or upon Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar went in, wiped them out, took them into captivity. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil. He has observed what they've done and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he does or doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt. Remember, taking us back. You brought us out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renowned as at this day we have sinned and done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee. Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city Jerusalem, the holy mountain, because for our sins and for the... iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O my God, for thy city and for thy people are called by thy name. And notice what he says. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yet while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, which is sacrifice, offerings. And he informed me, 
and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill, wisdom, and understanding. At the beginning of your prayer, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, to, to tell you, for thou art greatly beloved. How, com how confirming would that be? To tell you that you are greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter. And consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. And verses 24 through 27 are an answer to his prayer. For God is going to forgive the land of Israel and heal that nation. And he's going to restore those people to him. And he's going to do that ultimately through the tribulation period. And so, let's end there, okay? It took me longer to read that than I thought it would. But nevertheless, that's a lot of verses to read. So what we're going to do is, we're going to end right here. And we're going to pick right back up here next week, okay? And if you look, okay, notice what it says. Forgive our sin, heal our iniquity. When you look into verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, what? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make a reconciliation for iniquity. So this is an answer. You, you know what? They're ultimately going to be healed through the coming of the Messiah, and they're turning to him in the tribulation period. Okay? Um, any questions on that? I, that end, we had to kind of shoot through. Okay? But we'll pick back up right there. If you've got any questions, you know, just let me know. But you look through, the only week we're missing now, that 70th week, is the tribulation period. All right? Any cards? As far as 70 like that? Uh, 70 of 7? Not that I know of. Okay? I think that is uh, specifically mentioned there in Daniel. Okay? But, however, and I can bring it up next week, okay, the timeline fits... Okay, the timeline of events that have taken place in the Bible. Okay, and we can look at that next week. Okay, in fact, if you were to follow through, if you were to follow history, you would see the book of Daniel literally being fulfilled to the point that most scholars who are not Christians say that the prophecy, the prophecy of Daniel was fulfilled in such minute detail in history that they believe the book of Daniel was written after it was fulfilled is how accurate it was. So, uh, I mean, we can look at that, okay? All right, so there's no cards? Okay. Um, Jack and, and uh, Cindy have been gone, you know, for a few days. They should be back today sometime. But Linda Sexton... Uh, Clarence and Linda Sexton there. She had knee replacement yesterday at uh, Wesley Long. And uh, that was yesterday morning. No, this is Wednesday. That was Monday morning. I saw her yesterday.